It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Mike Puntrelli, the COO and partner of Memorial Park Dental Group. He joined Memorial Park Dental Group as their chief operator in 2015 to help with the expansion of their dental group. In 2015, the group consisted of one practice, which was acquired in 2006, and today the group has eight practice locations in the greater Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin areas. Their group sets themselves apart by deploying a doctor-centric partnership model with an entirely bespoke purchase arrangement. They are willing to purchase up to 200% of the value of the practice. They are rapidly expanding group aiming to provide patients and their respective communities with unparalleled service. This organization hopes to break down the barriers that exist between the patient and their dental health practitioner by providing an experience that creates a sense of comfort, trust, and accessibility. Um, my gosh, um, such a, it, it's the fastest growing segment of dentistry. I'm so honored yes. to have you come on the show. Thank you. All my homies listen to you. They're either um, just got out of school and they're an associate somewhere, um, sure. or they finally opened up their own one practice and they're having a hard time, you know, running one office. So I'd like to get major operators like you. You're running eight offices. Um, yeah. So I'm sure everybody having a hard time running their own office wants to hear more. So I, I want to start with this. Um, are you hiring kids right out of school? Well, is that, uh, is that part of your growth strategy that you come out of school and you'll give them a job? No, I mean, typically not, not at our size. I mean, our, so, so most of our engagements, our arrangements with our doctor partners really are the doctors are staying on for a period of time. Uh, and then we are finding and hand selecting an associate with, with, with that particular dentist. But we don't really hire new grads as a as a part of doing business now. Yeah, and you know what? None of my friends wants to hire a new grad, <laughs> and so and then and then they badmouth these big DSOs that hire a thousand of these new graduates. Like back in my day, the only person who would do that was the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, yeah. Indian Public Health Service. Yeah. And uh, so, kudos to all the people that will employ the recent grad who. Oh, absolutely. I mean, does anybody want it? Who, who wants a new grad? They've done well, like I mean, five you know, fillings not, when they get out of school. I mean, I've, we've look, we look at dentists that have sometimes a couple of years of experience. I mean, they're not coming right out of dental school. Um, I think that because we're, we're so focused on, and this doesn't, this doesn't mean that the new grad can't do it, but we're so focused on delivering an excellent patient experience and making sure the clinical work is really good that it's much easier for us to bank on a, on a true hard tested dentist who's, who's worked in some of those really arduous environments of, of corporate dentistry. And we really set ourselves apart by not really being corporate in the way we run our business. So I think we're really looking more for dentists that just have cut their teeth in the tougher environments, know how to communicate with the patients well, and, and, uh, and have sort of honed their, their clinical skills so that they fit with us. So right now you're running eight practices and I don't even see anything off the shelf to run a single office. I mean, like, like, like take practice yeah. manager software. I mean, I, I use open yeah. dental. The, the most famous is Dentrix and soft end. And I mean, they, they don't even hook up with an accounting package. I mean, they, they don't interface with Quicken. How the, so you must be using middleware accounting or, or how do you run the numbers of eight offices? Um, yeah. how, how do you do that? Well, first I offer a plug in though. I really love dental Intel. Right. Uh, I think, I think they're, a, they're a great outfit and a great shop. Uh, and they obviously plug in pretty easily with all of our practice management systems. And we have offices that are running on Eagle soft, open dental and Dentrix. Uh, so we have them on all three platforms and, and I really love, um, what dental Intel can do. I love the people there as well. In terms of the financial reporting, we have an in-house CFO, uh, he's actually a really brilliant guy. His name is Vincent, Vincent Varghese. Uh, he came on board roughly around the same time that I did when we first launched our expansion. He really built all of our proprietary KPI reporting tools and, and really built uh, the valuation uh, tool that we use. Uh, and, and he has sort of a proprietary way in which he looks at things. But you now on a quarterly basis, uh, he's the guy that we go to to give us that, that information, that insight. So, so you have a CFO then? Correct. And what's we his do. name? Is it Vincent what? Vincent. Vincent Varghese. Vincent Varghese. V-A-R-G-I-S? V-A-R-G-H-E-S-E. G-H-E-S-E. You got and it. Does he, is he the one who um, recommended uh, Dental Intel or um, 
Um, how, actually, how- actually, we we you know we really pride ourselves on trying to listen to everybody in the marketplace, and we actually came across Dental Intel. Uh, when we were at Scott Luna's breakaway course, uh, we had went out to go see what he was about, and we ran into these guys at at, uh, at Dental Intel, and we just loved them, uh, loved their pitch, and we started using them, and it was a great tool, great tool ever since. Um, it's gotten better and better and more robust. My God, I had him on. When I podcasted him, um, we talked for three hours. We made three shows. Um, yeah. Uh, Scott Luna. Um, Love Scott, love his wife, love, um, you know, I think he's a great guy, but my God, he's so controversial. What what do you think makes him controversial? Because he's in the DSO space and all the solo dentists want to keep it that way. Does, does he just represent the DS, DSO Godzilla? Is that why he's controversial or what, what do you make of it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, so I didn't know he was really quite that controversial. I know, I know, DSO the, the term itself is is controversial, right? Um, I also think that you know when you speak to some of these very big accountants in in the community, they'll tell you that most of their clients just have a thirst for wanting to understand uh, what DSOs can do and what they're really about. I think there's a lot of ignorance in the marketplace as to what they do, and I think a lot of them have given themselves a bad name by just not operating properly. And I think so anybody that really becomes a DSO sort of uh, is a sort of reaps the the bad reputation that comes along with that. But uh, but Scott was a nice guy. He was gracious. He's obviously a very smart guy. He's uh, uh, he's he's earned his I would say cockiness to a certain extent, right? I mean he's he's done some pretty amazing things. Uh, yeah, no, I mean and and I thought his breakaway conference was uh, his seminar was was uh, quite in depth, and we we did learn uh, quite a lot coming away from that. I, I think what really sets us apart, makes us unique, is we're willing to borrow and take from what many others in the community are doing. I mean, we, we don't know what we don't know and we're always willing to, to, to get better. So, um, you, um, you said, um, Vincent Varghese and, yeah. um, you, that you have offices and you have eight and they're running right. off Eagle soft open dental and dentrix. She's listening to right. you right now. And she's thinking, uh, two things. She's, I want to set up my own office. You, um, um, dentrix is the largest by shine. Eagle Soft's the second sure. largest by, Patterson, Open Dentals, uh, um, probably third. Uh, and most people that come on the show won't talk about it. Because let, let's say you came from Dental Intel. If I yeah. ask the guy from Dental Intel which one's the best practice manager software, well, he doesn't want to piss off his whole supply chain channel. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. so uh, yeah, I don't see any horse that you're afraid of uh, no. on this practice manager software. So which one of those three do you think uh, you and Vincent like the most? If she had to pick one of those, which one and why? Yeah, so I think Vincent would tell you. I'll answer for him. I think he would say Open Dental is his favorite. I yes, think it's yes. yeah, yeah. I, I think he, I chose. I, that's why I, I, he would tell you. I, I would. I tend to agree with him. I know Dentrix is far more robust, but I think if you want to do a little bit more, I think Open Dental is a little friendlier. Well, what, what what I like about it is um, everybody now has it because I, I I met this kid over the weekend, yeah. and he's been watching all these. Uh, what what is that? A uh, Python. Artificial intelligence programming. Okay. He's yeah, he, he just been watching YouTube videos and he, he's already a fairly good Python program and open dental. You could hire that kid and he can make sure. a bridge to anything. And Absolutely. if you're out there and you want to make a bridge, will somebody please make a bridge from open dental to any accounting software that can run a real business. And that, and if you say Quicken or QuickBooks Pro, uh, you're so green behind the ears, you don't even know you're an amateur. Um, <laughs> what, so that's my next question for you. So to run eight offices, what accounting system are you on? Yeah, so I actually do think uh, we use QuickBooks uh, and we have, an, we have an accountant that we partner with. Remember, we're still in the, we're still in the, the, the startup phase, right? We have eight locations. I think we don't even become an emerging DSO until we hit about 10. Um, and really what we've been focused on as of late is really honing that infrastructure and getting the right people in place. Right now, it's just been a three-man team, and we're doing everything we can to make sure we deliver great service and experience for our patients, and and uh, and we trust the people that we've surrounded ourselves with. So really, we rely on our accountant to provide us with that information, and, and we do use QuickBooks as the primary accounting software, and our CFO is the guy we really lean on to – to give us the insight that we're looking for from a financial perspective. Um, yeah, and that is the only reason, uh, that, that is the main reason I cannot stand uh, Bill Clinton. They, they always say never talk about religion, politics, sex, or violence. But, I'll talk about politics all day with you. But Bill Gates, uh, I mean, uh, 
Yeah, Bill Gates, you know, he set a standard. Uh, you know, when, when they started building railroads in the United States, everybody was building their own their own width and dimension. So when they get bankrupt, sure. no one could use the asset. So they finally, the economists explained to the malfunctioning government that you need to create standards. Sure. Um, we, you know, um, look at electricity. I mean, by having everybody use a 120, anybody can make a toaster, buy a toaster. And, sure. and Bill Gates, what he did was he created a standard. It was mainframe computers. And you had to learn Cobalt and Fortran. And then they came out with the mini, the microcomputer. So he came out with Microsoft software, which became a standard with Word and PowerPoint and Excel. And he tried to buy Quicken so that there'd be a standardized accounting patch. And, and Bill Clinton blocked it and went to war with them. And yeah. when, when Bill Gates finally threw in the towel, that was when the Y2K bubble He'd start selling all of his positions about a year before the Y2K bubble popped. And what he should have been doing with Bill Clinton is saying, hey, Bill, let's get your government paperless. Here it is 20 years after that, yeah. 20 years after that. And I, I yeah. can't get my driver's license online. They're not paperless. They're not all digital because Bill Clinton had to go the battle of the bills. And we're sitting here two decades later, not paperless. And we're sitting here today. And these dentists don't know, you know, like if a patient, if, if I go to a dental office and the doc walks out of the room and I said, hey, sure. you just did an MOD composite on number three. Did you yeah. make $8 after taxes net income or did you lose four bucks? They have no idea. They have no, right. I, they have no idea. And so as long as we're sitting in, the, in these bizarre times, so you like dental intel. Why did you go with dental intel as opposed to um, practice by numbers, let's say? Our, um... Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it was just we when we, we ran into them, we just tried them out and we got used to what we had. Um, and I think just like with anything else, relationships are important. Um, we learned how to use the software. It took a while to learn how to use it and implement it. And once you're you're in the groove of things and in the swing of things, why change if it ain't broke, right? So um, I'm sure maybe there are some other competitors out there that can provide the same information, but we've really fallen in love with Dental Intel and really like their team and their support, frankly. Okay. Yeah. Um, I agree. Um, so, so what makes, what makes, um, um, the, the dentist founder of that group, um, Dr. Nishano yeah. Thomas, what, 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 what's going on in her journey when she decides oh, yeah. I want to go from a solo practicing, I'm all good yeah. Monday through Thursday. Yeah. So now I want to, uh, tackle Godzilla and own eight offices. Where, where, where does that come from? Yeah, so, you know, there's a story behind that, which I, I think will sort of pull your heartstrings. Um, back in 2004-ish, I could be about a year off on this one. So 2004, 2005, Dr. Thomas, uh, at the time, the Shano had kidney failure. And because of that, she was put on to uh, dialysis. And if you know anything about dialysis, I mean, it's one of the most draining things you can to be alive, right? It's one of the most draining things that you can put yourself through. And she was working for a dentist in town. She's actually uh, an oral surgeon from South Africa originally, uh, very well trained. She went to UPenn under the international program and then moved to Texas with her husband. And uh, while she was working, the dentist uh, took her off of her daily guarantee and put her on production because she was going on dialysis and she ended up out producing her, her day rate three times. Uh, much to the chagrin of the dentist she was working for at the time. Uh, it's quite unfortunate. Then the dentist started playing some games back and forth and kept changing her comp structure really to just affect his own pocketbook. And she would come home rather unhappy. She wasn't being treated properly, treated well, and she felt like she was being abused and used improperly. And her husband really took the initiative to say, look, you, you, you love practicing dentistry. We all know that. What can we do to get you out of this situation? So she found a, he got a letter in the mail, believe it or not, which doesn't happen, frankly, that often. And the letter was for a practice in sale right in downtown Houston, uh, right across from Memorial Park, believe it or not. And that office was a very small office. It was like a $600,000 office. And really without much thinking, just bought the office for her, for his wife, because I mean, look, it wasn't even about making the money. It was about the quality of life and the lifestyle and her being able to do something. Well, found out that it was a DHMO office and we all know what happens in that situation. So a $600,000 DHMO office is a bear to run. You're not making any money. So today that flagship is doing about three and a half million. And it took a lot of work to get it to that, to that level. But 
Uh, since that time, since 2004, 2005 to present day, she's had three kidney transplants. And so really the main driver for this has been, how does she create a long lasting legacy for her family? And part of that is obviously making money. Uh, and how does she get out of the chair and not, you know, be working such a, a backbreaking taxing job, which it is uh, to be a dentist. So she practices when she wants to practice and she's around the patients she wants to be around. And her family largely is around her family and friends to help run the rest of the practice for her. So really this has been an evolution uh, since 2004, 2005 to present day to, to get her out of the chair and to create a legacy for her family. We're not a non-for-profit business. We do want to make money and we think we're good at it. But really what we've been very good at doing, Howard, is, is growing practices. Uh, we've seen as, as the best growth I think was recorded at about 366% for Memorial Park, but our lowest in about six months is about 25%. So we're all over the map, but we do a very good job for our dentists. And, uh, and obviously Nishano is very happy about that. Wow, that is a uh, that is a tear jerking story. How how's she doing now? She's doing much better, much better. I mean, her creatinine is down to I think 0. 0.7, and it was I mean before tra the last tra transplant she had, I think it was probably hovering around three or four or something like that. I mean, she was she really was she's a walking miracle when you think about it. And is, is her husband uh, um, part of the, the the team too? Yeah, her husband's a part of the team, and he's really the brains behind but, it. But, so but her husband is that is that um is that Mark? That is Mark, correct. Okay, but yeah. they, they have different last names, though. That's what's confusing me. Is that because she's got a she's a dentist? Yeah. So, so well, it's interesting, actually. Um, so Nishano and Mark both come from a very interesting Christian sect that originates in Syria, uh, called Kanai, and and as a part of their culture, they'll take the first name. The wife or woman will take the first name of of the father as their last name. So her father's first name is Thomas. Hence the reason why her name is Nishano Thomas. Wow. And that's a Syrian Christian group, huh? The Syrian Christian group, very, very old, goes back, uh, I don't know, about 1,500 years or something like that. In fact, every marriage is recorded in one book in Syria today. You can still go to Syria and you can see your marriage recorded there. You can't marry out and you can't marry in. So it's a very, very unique religion. Huh, that is very interesting. Um, yes. Very Super interesting. interesting. They're, they're Orthodox uh, Christianity, and I've been to their baptisms, and, uh, and I mean, they're very long. Their masses during Christmas are sometimes four to six hours. It's, it's a very old school religion. Very interesting. Huh. Fact, uh, I, now, Steve, I, Steve Jobs, uh, his father was Syrian. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, okay. Stephen Paul Jobs, uh, his, uh, his uh, biological father, uh, Abu Fatah, John al Jadal, Arabic, grew up in home Syria. I was born yeah. in a very, very interesting. I, I, the, the, the funniest thing I always can't understand about America is that if you ask anybody with a PhD in economics or history, what made this the greatest country in the world? They said, because people immigrated here on, they voted with their feet for 500 years. The greatest, yeah. most ambitious, bright eyed bushy tailed people came here from all around the world. And then you're like, okay, so, so you, you're ready to open back up Ellis Island and keep it going? No, <laughs> no. It's like, oh, okay, so what made us great, you just want to stop. No, like, absolutely. It's like, okay, we're done. Um, so yeah. um, uh, the, the crazy. So um, whenever you talk to anybody in DSO world, yeah, the number one problem is um, finding associates. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and a lot of people say, you know, the average uh, dentist in these DSOs, they only last a year or two. Well, it's the same in private practice. There's not, nothing different than private practice with those. How do you find a dental associate? Um, you and I both don't want out of school. You want them with experience. How yeah. long How long do they have to stay with you, do you before you say, this, this was a good deal. They lasted this long. So they made relationships. We made money. It was all a win-win yeah. situation. And then where do you see the turnover where it's starting to scare the patients yeah. every time? You know, that's why I'm not afraid of DSOs out here. Every time someone comes in from DSO, they just say, well, I went in there and they said I needed eight fillings. I went back to have it done. That dentist wasn't even there. And then I, there's another one and then another yeah. one. And, and finally, yeah. after I've seen four different dentists, uh, my friend told me to come see you. So, so yeah. Dental associates, where do you find them? How long do they stay? Uh, what percent of the graduates do you think just want to be a dental associates? What percent of them just want to work for you until they learn how to do basic dentistry, then open up those? So talk all things associates. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, so I've interviewed a lot of associates and, and it's it's sort of all over the map. I think, you know, just to sort of touch on something you had said before about some of these practices, especially the corporate practices where uh, the associates are funneled in and out and the patients aren't getting good experience. I think that's really largely reflective of a poor comp structure uh, and retention strategy for the dentist. I mean, it's a, it's a very, you know, basic human capital approach that just gets missed and, and overlooked. Uh, I, and I think it's also a very poor uh, middle management, really managing those those dentists. And largely, I think it's also, once these corporates get so big and get so bloated, I think that they can't really provide the right kind of experience. It's just too big of a of an operation to manage. And, and most of the, the executives in the DSO world would agree with me uh, when it comes to that. And I think the, the other big issue is that a lot of, uh, a lot of non-clinical professionals, executives, however you want to put it, start getting involved in the clinical, even though they say they don't. And they start talking about pushing performance and metrics in areas that really you can't push and drive, right? It's, it's you have a doctor's capability and, and they can only improve so much. So I think that's the reason why you see a lot of that turnover. But you now finding the right dentist is, is one about making the right kind of connection. Uh, it's, it's a still a very big human element. You know, do you get the right vibe when you get in front of that dentist? Do they get along with you? Um, you know, do you get along with them? Do you think you can work with that person? Uh, we use many different sourcing methods, everything from dental posts to Indeed to using recruiters. I mean, it's a whole gamut of, of of strategies and ways in which you can you can find and attract associates, all pretty standard like any other profession. Um, but as long as you get the right associate with about three to five years of experience minimum, uh, and you give them a couple of good working interviews. Really, you don't find out how well they really work for a good six months, right? You just you just don't. Um, but you, you really aren't at uh, at any liberty to just kick that doctor out after six months. Really, what I think you need to do is help improve that doctor when you have them. Uh, so, I mean, it's hard for me to answer a part of your question, which is what are the long run effects of that? Because I mean, we've only been doing this the acquisitions for you know about thirty months. So what I can tell you is that the doctors who have stayed on seem to like working for us, which is great for us. And for the associates that we brought on board, they seem like work, they like to work for us as well. Um, but I think the, the associates that do want to leave, they mostly want to leave because they want to open up their own practice. And I think that you know, you're always going to run into that problem with associates because any associate is worth their own salt eventually, right? Once they've, they've proven themselves to be legitimate producers, they, they get that itch and they want to, they want to see what it's going to be like on the other side. My job is really to prove to them or show them an alternate option to stay with us. So, um, what, when you, you've acquired, how, how many practices have you bought? So we've, we purchased six offices. We've done one de novo and then well, actually, we've actually purchased altogether seven offices, but the first office, our flagship was bought in 2006. And we've done about six acquisitions since 2016, 2017-ish. Um, and one de novo we did back in 2015, 2016. And uh, um, so de novo is uh, yeah. start from scratch. And yeah. so acquisition. So you bought seven dental office acquisitions. She's listening right now. She's never bought one. My, my, my first question on acquisitions is when you yeah. go to Wall Street, there yeah. are always, I mean, when I was born, I'll, I'll be this Thursday, I'll be 57. When I was born in 62, the yeah. average S&P 500 company was about that age. It was over 60. Now that I'm going to be 57, almost 60, the average S&P 500 company is not even, is a teenager. It's not even 18 yeah. years. So they're yeah. always merger, acquisition, merger, acquisition. And sure. most of the dentists, they'll be in a small town of like four dentists. And the old fat senile guy finally gets ready to retire. And it's like, okay, so you're going to buy that, right? You're going to buy that and roll it in your office. No, 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 no. And then, and then it'll sell to some 25 year old, highly energetic person that's willing to, and it's like, and, and whenever I see a, a dentist that's doing two, three, $4 million a year, they're like, I didn't want that old guy to sell to some young puppy. I, I bought it when he put the practice sold, I bought it, rolled it up to mine. In fact, I was able to talk him into coming back and working for me a day or two a week. So my question is, yeah. um, why do you think dentists don't do mergers and acquisitions? And when you do one, what are you actually yeah. looking for? Why did you buy the seven you're looking for? Yeah, yeah. So, well, I mean, that's that's a very deep question to ask, right? And so there, there are multiple answers there. Um, why don't dentists do a lot of mergers and acquisition work? 
I don't think it's really in their blood. Um, and that's not a bad thing. I think that um, dentists become healthcare providers because they like working on patients. They like helping people and helping patients. And I think that they're sometimes there's a, there's a point where you stop being able to do that as a provider, unless you have associates in your office and you're a great manager, you stop being able to do that if you're, if you're owning multiple locations, right? Which is why when, when a dentist does do it, they have to step away, right? They have to step away and they have to give the reins to the associates and pick the right associates to do that, but they, but they can't step away completely. Um, so I just don't think it's in there. If you were to ask Mary who works for us, what gives you the, the greatest satisfaction every day? It's, helping out that patient in the chair. That's what they like doing. Well, that's what she likes doing. I can speak for her. Uh, and I think the same thing could be said for Joby and any of the dentists that, that are working uh, for us today. Um, you know, what do we look for? Well, so we, we have pretty specific criteria. So I, I, a little plug in here for us. Um, you know, we're typically looking for practices that are doing, you know, north of a million dollars. We like practices doing about 1.2, 1.3. Uh, we like practices in suburban areas, high growth areas. We don't really do any any DHMO or Medicaid business. Uh, the practices are usually going to be in network preferred, uh, although we will work with a fee for service practice and ideally a doctor looking to stay on. And, and most of the doctors who are uh, looking to partner with us, which is how we really think about this, even though we're acquiring that practice, most of most of the doctors are looking to get equity out of that practice, you know, cash in some chips. Uh, pay down some debt. Some are looking to flat out just retire because they're tired of practicing or they're tired of managing or they need more time with their family and we're able to facilitate that for them. Um, in fact, this is one little plug in and I hope I answered your question. If not, please just challenge me on it and I'll, I'll continue you know, answering for you. But we have gotten so confident in our ability to grow practices that we have started communicating with some of our partners in the dental community, everything down to a, to a supply rep, to an executive at a, at a big holding company, uh, or even accountants in the community. We've pretty much told them, look, we're willing to go into a dental practice that fits our, our basic high level criteria and invest up to $100,000 of our own money into that practice, zero recourse to the dentist. They don't owe us anything. And the only thing we ask is that if we grow their practice, which we can do and we've done it. In fact, our last practice acquisition was 900,000. It's now doing 1.8 million or 1.7 million. It comes out to roughly 96% growth. All we ask is that we take 50% of the results. So both parties win. And I don't think there's anybody in the dental community willing to do that, to put their money where their mouth is or anybody willing to work on contingency. They're more likely to come in there and tell them, tell the doctor that they've got the secret sauce and they're gonna have to pay them monthly and hopefully something happens. But that's how confident we are uh, about our business model and what we do and how we can grow practices and deliver these results for doctors. Okay, so let me see if I got this right. You prefer acquiring dental offices who collect, what did you say, 1 million a year? Or what did you say, collect? Uh, well, so, so they've gotta be doing at least a million dollars a year. Uh, and there, there are multiple reasons for that. Yeah, multiple million dollars a year, um, in-network preferred. Well, wait, but, but, but talk about, um, <clears throat> she needs to know how you think. Why, why sure. do you want a dental office that's collecting at least 1 million a year? Well, so it's a little bit different. When an owner occupier runs an office, they can risk to take a lower salary, right? For, for us, after all the, the overhead, is taken off the table. There's not much margin left. I mean, you know, to put it in perspective, you know, we might make fifty to one hundred thousand dollars on a practice that's doing about a million dollars. Okay, okay. at, at 1.2, 1.3 million, the profitability is a little bit better, but we can we can compensate our doctors more handsomely or richly, we should say, and be able to provide them with greater earnings potential as an associate, as opposed to them going somewhere else and. And, okay. opening up the and then, then you said um, dental offices that are in network for dental insurance and not right. fee for service. We would prefer that. We can work with fee for service offices, but we prefer an in network office. Okay, she doesn't even know what in network dental office means. She's sure. uh, a quarter of my homies are still in dental school, and the sure. rest are all under thirty. So, okay. you're talking to my dental kindergarten class, what I'm what, what does to... that even mean? In network. Um, ex explain explain what that is and why you're looking for that. Yeah, so, so in-network means you're contracted with the insurance companies based on particular price guidelines, right? So the insurance co company recognizes you as a preferred provider through their network. And as a result, the network will, at some level, deliver you patients. It also communicates to the public that you, from a pricing perspective, 
are within an affordability range as opposed to, uh, to give you the best example, right, for those listening who don't know, I could be an out-of-network office and be charging $1,500 for a crown as opposed to an in-network office charging $800 for a crown, right? So there's a, there's a big difference. Um, with that, there are some considerations, though, which means you've got to do much more work in an in-network office than an out-of-network office to earn the same amount of money. But you've got what I would say to be a more recession-proof and a safer business that you're running, one that uh, isn't as dependent upon the doctor. So um, so another way to say this to her is it just dental offices that are signed up for the PPOs? Exactly. And do you take all the PPOs? You said you didn't take Medicare yeah. or Medicaid. Well, so but that wouldn't be that wouldn't be considered a PPO. Um, so Medicare and oh, Medicaid would be uh, government insurance, uh, and typically we don't favor that because there's just too much, I would say, regulatory risk around um, Medicare, and there, there's also a ton of compliance risk. Um, I, I'm sure you're familiar with Nate Shot, Murfreesboro out of Tennessee. Are you familiar? Yeah, yeah. With- I'll, I'll just say it real simple. Uh, yeah. When you get in bed with the government, you're going yeah. to get screwed. And they Absolutely. play a very heavy yeah. hand. And I know a dentist right now who's practicing in Mexico because his <sighs> beloved and beautiful, and I loved Karen, his his wife receptionist was screwing up all the Medicaid billing. Okay, yeah. so international people- and quite by accident, quite by accident. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. So international yeah. people, um, it's so confusing. The United States has a federal government and that's Medicare, which which takes yep. care of people over 65. Medicaid is with each one of the 50 states. Uh, Obama did the craziest thing when he rolled out Obamacare. Since he rolled it out through Medicaid, it was 50. Most people like in Arizona that were on access didn't even know Obamacare uh, yep. was was access. So it was, it was a branding nightmare. If he would have done Obamacare for Medicare, at least everyone w- would have known what the hell he was doing. But Medicaid is different in all 50 states. But here's the deal. You, you, um, hell, half the dental offices right now are getting embezzled again. So obviously if you, if you can be embezzled again, you're going to have a receptionist screwing up all your billing codes. Yep. And yep. then if Medicaid at the state level, um, finds out you're doing something wrong, you'll probably go to freaking jail. So, well, you know, what, you, just, what you know, I, I mean, the most recent case, we were actually floored by this. I mean, what, what really happened sort of as a synopsis of his office was that he had employed a bonus system in his office. And you know that dental employees sometimes, uh, they're not cut from the right cloth. Sometimes they come from the wrong you know, area. And um, I'm not speaking for all broadly, but it can happen in any business, right? Someone's Are you talking s- about my five sisters? No, not at all. <laughs> no, but- Sure, uh, sure. What they were doing was they were just submitting fraudulent procedures to the insurance company because it would cook the production numbers so they'd get a bonus. But the, the effect of that was that the doctor who's in charge of that unknowingly was was then being investigated and they wanted to, to make an example of him uh, because they don't have a huge budget to do that. And he's now in prison for 30 months and all because his employees wanted to hit a bonus. So anything that can can cause a loophole like that for our business, we want to stay away from completely. Yeah. And um, you know what? So it's, it's called the downside. It's like when you say you want to go. Uh, parachuting and you know your best idea was to jump out of a perfectly good airplane and I say well what, what's the upside oh I can say I did it what's the downside yeah. you're flipping dead I, I mean yeah. and and you don't just do don't it. deal with the government I mean like right don't. now everybody's outraged because they're hearing that China has like a million Muslims in prison and I'm like yeah that's that's really bad right so how sure. many how many does your government have in prison right now <laughs> they're like what yeah well your government has 2.3 million people in prison. So if, you're, so if you're outraged with China, so you're going to let everybody out of jail who smoked pot and did not do a violent, you're going to pardon them all today? Oh, uh, no. So, um, yeah, you <laughs> just you just can't do business with the government because their hand is so heavy, it's not worth the downside. It's like why I don't do in-office sedation. Because if it goes right, it's just awesome. You put her to sleep, she woke up, her wisdom teeth were gone. But if it goes wrong one time, you're toast, you're depressed. And that's why the only three publicly traded DSOs in the world, two in in Australia, one 300 dentist, uh, one 300 smile, uh, um, the other one's uh, smile Pacific, and then the one H&R out of uh, Singapore, all three, in order to go public, their lawyers said, 
no in office sedation for anyone under 18 and over 65 because that's when everybody dies from IV station under 18 over 65 and you and they don't want to do business with the government either because they don't want to have Karen in accounting do something uh in uh in this case yeah. my friend his wife just she was just incompetent and yeah. so now they get to retire in Mexico and live out their life because if they come back to here uh they're going to go to jail uh, for just being ignorant, yet the government is the most ignorant entity uh, in in the country today. So enough enough of that stuff. Um, yeah. So um, so you don't take minutes. So um, you're so you wanted a dental office that collects one point three million a year. You wanted yeah. one that's in network and signed up for PPOs. Uh, I know you don't take Medicare, Medicaid, or getting better the government, but do you yeah. take every PPO? In Texas, uh, sure, pretty much. Okay. I, I mean, uh, okay. there, there are some restrictions in that some of these PPO insurances will okay. only let you see a specific in-network provider. Which, if we're out of network, we won't be able to do that. And, and, and if we can get a network with it, we will. Are you going to change their name? I mean, uh, are you Kroger, no. where you, you, you buy a grocery store, you let them keep their name, or do you you let them keep their own name? No. So, so one of the things that really sets us apart not only is a, a flexible engagement model, which you opened up with. Uh, is that we don't mess with the community brand. It's very similar to what Heartland does as an example. We don't mess with the community brand, but more specifically, we do not mess with the staff culture. I think too often doctors are not given enough credit for the culture they built. And, and what a lot of acquirers make a mistake in doing is when they walk into a dental office, they think that they know how to do things properly and they know how to do it right. Well, you can have a million and one great ideas, but if you don't have the people there to execute them, they no longer are good ideas. So, you know, one of the things we typically try to do is understand how that office operates beforehand uh, and work with the doctor very closely to have that doctor remain a leader in their practice so that that transition is smooth and so that we don't ruffle any feathers in that process, right? So the, the, the employees feel like uh, they're appreciated and, and then that their practice is going to remain the same practice it was before they sold it. In fact, as far as we're concerned, nobody has to know they sold it to us. We can be introduced as partners for all we care. We have... Uh, no ego in the game whatsoever. Um, so you're uh, you're just like Kroger then. Uh, when Kroger buys a grocery store, like say Kroger in uh, Arizona is Fry's, in Kansas it's Dillon's. Uh, what's the Kroger's grocery store called out there? Kroger. <laughs> is it? Yes, it's called Kroger. That's why I didn't know. I don't know much about the Kroger brand to know that they, they own a lot of other uh, subsidiaries. But uh, no, it's just Kroger here. Um, but we we don't believe in franchise value, uh, i.e., you know, uh, Castle Dental or any of those things. We we don't do that at all. Yeah. Um, so um, Kroger owns, uh, my gosh, um, Ralph's, Dylan, Smith's, Kings, Super, City Market, Fries, That's amazing. UFC, that. Harry, and but I, but you said it elegantly. You said you don't want to interfere. Um, with the the community brand, so they've been they've been first brand dental. Um, so, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep uh, honing you down on this. Uh, you you talked about when you go into an office, you're able to grow their practice. And yeah. when I look at the behavior on Dental Town, they'll spend the most amount of time if they're gonna have to spend a lot of money. So the, she's wondering. She just walked out of school. Yeah. Two hundred eighty five. Do when you say that you spend a hundred thousand dollars in a newly acquired dental office, is that because you spent a hundred thousand dollars on a new CAD CAM machine or a CBCT no. machine or some hundred thousand dollar laser? No. And does no, I mean, does she need those big purchases to be all in the fast lane like you? You know this this could go multiple directions, right? But uh, it depends what you want to do as a dentist, right? I mean, uh, is the technology necessary? Absolutely. Is it, is it, is it necessary right out of the bat? Maybe not so. Uh, it, it depends on what your proficiency and capabilities as a dentist are. Uh, if, you know, if you're very confident in your capability and you just want a, a bread and butter general dentistry office, yeah, I mean, you probably want a cone beam because it's, it's a great piece of technology, but it might not be something you need for the first six months as you're scaling up your business. Maybe you want to focus on getting cleanings in the door and, and do, you know, bread and butter dentistry, like crown filling and bridge. Do you um, think, do you think um, a hundred thousand dollar CAD cam is a wise investment or not really? You know, it's hard for me to answer that question because again, it, it all comes down to the dentist. I mean, for us, we really just want to focus on practices that are, that are, have a very strong annuity based hygiene program, meaning patients coming in the door, they trust you. They believe in you as a dentist. Uh, they're not afraid to come to you. And when they have to do their work, they'll do their work, crown filling and bridge. Um, I mean, if you wanna do implants as an example and, and you have a, a goal set 
to do a certain number of implants, you could probably back out the ROI on spending a hundred something thousand dollars on a comb beam. I mean, you know, we, we have one, one office that um, we're looking at actually getting one, but it's going to be a hub where we send a lot of our patients. And I think we can get that CAD cam for around 75. So, I mean, but you know, again, you know it, where you buy the cheapest CAD cam? Where, where? Dentaltown has a classified ad. We have 5,612 oh, well, classified ads and it's the big, and I, when I go out there and lecture, the, the, the dentists that came up and they want to buy me dinner, or the, the, they feel like they really owe yeah. me. It's because they bought some $40,000 laser on uh, Dental Town classified ads that the guy bought for $120,000. Uh, um, so, yeah, the classified ads. But I, I want to hold your feet to the fire. Um, yeah. Do, do you prefer urban or rural? Uh, okay, very good question. I would say we prefer neither. So I would prefer suburban. <laughs> That wasn't one of the choices. Perfect. That wasn't yeah, one no, of the, it was A or B. You just can't right, make C if up. You wanna, if you wanna hold me, yeah, if you wanna hold me to it, I would tell you both have their complexities. In terms of the best doctor relationship, Howard, go rural every day of the week. I mean, I have met some of the friendliest and nicest dentists in rural Texas, in rural America for that matter. Um, they're, they're, they're just a different breed um, and their practices are, I think, uh, I, I can make this claim, most of the time, majority of the time, they're more profitable. And that's because I think these rural dentists are able to, to, to hold on to a greater market share than you can in urban areas that are heavy, more heavily saturated. Conversely, you, you have a much harder time staffing those offices uh, over the long run. And I think that's what a lot of rural dentists are actually finding. Uh, urban urban offices, you have no problem staffing them. Uh, and you don't have to worry about some of those trickier issues in running the business that you would in a rural area. But if you really were to hold my feet to the fire, I would tell you I love rural practices. Because I, I think what really is, is the best thing is the relationship with the doctor. That's the most important thing. If you've got a good relationship with the doctor and you both agree on things together, you can make anything happen. But but some people say they don't want to be a DSO in a rural area because it's uh it's it's hard to find doctors to work out there. Yeah. Uh, but I asked you, do you for urban or rural? You said neither. Is that because the answer was suburban? Correct. Yeah. Suburban suburban is really our target market, and that's because you have a lot of rooftops, you have a lot of families that are going to be staying in the area. I'll, I'll give you a good example. Um, our marketing spend in urban practice locations is much higher than it is in suburban. And that's because the urban areas, and you can take Houston as an example, it's a heavily oil and gas rich business market. Uh, it has a lot of foreign transplants, a lot of yuppies. And what ends up happening is when the foreigners come in and out and leave, you have a, a cycle of your patient base. The marketing spend must be higher in order to attract new patients because of that. But when people get married and have families, they end up moving and settling in the suburbs. So overall, your, your patient experience has to be much better and your, your marketing spend is much higher to keep fulfilling the new patient bucket uh, every every three to four years. Okay, so um, you bought seven dental office via acquisitions and you did one Correct. de novo. So Correct. does that mathematically mean you just prefer acquisitions over de novo? Why, why was only one a de novo, which, which means starting from the beginning anew? Why, yeah. do, why, why just one start from the beginning scratch practice and why seven uh, acquisitions? Yeah, so uh, that's an interesting question. That's more of our personal experience. I mean, you could talk to uh, people in the community, doctors in the community, or even uh, non-doctor operators that love de novos because they believe they have the secret sauce for it. For us, when specifically when our, our CFO crunched the numbers on this, we found out that you're running a higher risk with a de novo in opening it from a financial perspective, but you also can exceed the entire cost for that practice when doing a de novo. Uh, the CapEx uh, and the operational expenses associated with uh, a de novo sometimes can exceed that of an actual acquisition between 70-80% of revenue. So uh, it's, it's also very, very location dependent. I really do believe my, our conviction is that the success of your de novo practice is going to be probably 75% at least dependent upon the location you put that practice in alone. Uh, I think, you know, visibility is extremely important when it comes to getting new patients. So you think the location is 70% of your success? 
I, you know, I'm, I'm throwing a number out there. I'd hate for someone who, who could prove me wrong to prove me wrong. But, but our conviction is it's, it's a, a big majority, a vast majority of the success. It's it, going to be location driven. It's location driven. And so it's not urban, uh, which is downtown, which, um, but sure. by the way, um, lecturing in 50 countries, the, the reason downtowns are so messed up in America is because of the way you subsidize gas. So, and what I mean by that is when you go to buy gas, it's just, you're buying the gas from the gas company. In yeah. all the other countries, the gas is taxed to pay for all the roads and bridges. So that's why your gas is $2 a gallon and it's $8 a gallon everywhere else because when you're paying $8 a gallon, you don't want to commute in from the suburbs. So you realize, sure. man, I'm spending $10,000 a year on gas. I'm just going to move downtown. So when you go to London and Paris and Tokyo sure. and De all, everybody has an awesome downtown because they don't, sure. the government doesn't subsidize the gas. So what they do here is they pay for all the roads and bridges out of general taxation. So no one has an incentive to conserve. In fact, you even call it a freeway and, 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 you can't yeah. have anything free in the world because then you violate all the rules of economics. So you don't want to go <laughs> urban yeah. because of the, there's no, we don't tax gasoline for the total cost of the car, the roads, the bridges, whatever. So we have freeways. So they all escape the urban blight and go to this um, um, suburbs. And you're saying yeah. that's where the, the, the sweet spot is in dentistry. You like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Those are the best locations. Okay. Yeah. And then when, um, um, and by the way, um, when I was talking to uh, other DSO people, um, they said they don't like to, um, um, acquire practices. They prefer to do a de novo because yeah. when they go to acquire a dental practice, the, the staff is so dysfunctional that by the time they, fire Karen, the assistant, and hire Ellen as a new, yep. but by the time they go over all that stuff, they, they, they've got a migraine and they, they wish they never even went into dentistry. And so you're yep. saying what you're really looking for the most is a trusted brand, loyal staff um, culture. And that's why yeah. you don't change the community brand. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, we have had our issues, of course, when, when uh, transitioning a practice, everybody will, but we just feel like the risk profile is much higher on the on the de novo, and I, I can point to people I know in the community very very well that would disagree with me on that. Um, but for us, we just believe that the risk profile is lower on the acquisition front, and and we believe that we're able to, with our capabilities, to manage the staffing a little bit uh, a little bit better. Uh, I think that the main issue with with acquisitions and the reason why they don't work and the reason why that culture is an issue is because they go about it the wrong way. What they do is a lot of these DSOs will go in and communicate quite overtly that things are going to change and change drastically, as opposed to we're coming here to work with you. I think that is the key, uh, the key component to failure for uh, for a lot of these major DSOs. Uh, but then again, I, I want to be careful in, in in even classifying them as failures because I'm only 30 months old, so <laughs> I have to I have to take a step back and. Uh, and and uh, be careful what I'm saying as well, right? Because you know we may have an issue down the road as well. Um, so I loved your pun when you said, "Would you buy a dental office? You invest a hundred thousand dollars into a newly acquired dental office. You sure. got to put your money where your mouth is. Put your yeah. money where your mouth is. If that isn't the hallmark pun of dentistry, um, yeah. so when you invest a hundred thousand dollars into a newly acquired dental office, where 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 are the, these uh, uh, Benjamins going? Well, so uh, for, it's a six-step six process, but let me clarify something, right? It's a six-step uh, proprietary process. Uh, a good majority of it is marketing, both internal and external. Um, we believe we do have a secret sauce when it comes to that and understanding its attribution, which a lot of dentists, especially those that you were talking about when they come out of dental school, are, are probably going to spend money on uh, when trying to grow their de novo or startup. Uh, but it's it's not 100000 into the practice we just bought. What I was actually referencing was a whole other strategy for practices we haven't bought in order to justify our capabilities in the marketplace. I'm willing to go to an office I don't even own. And I'm willing to tell that office that's doing a million, a million to, hey, look, I know that I'm good enough at being able to grow your business. My team is good enough to grow your business that I'm willing at no recourse to you to invest $100,000 of my own money into growing your business for you. And all I ask is that we split the results 50-50. 
I think that is you know the pun of, of that makes a lot of sense, right? It's we we are putting our money where our mouth is, and we're we're proving to the dental community that we're worthy to do business with, as opposed to uh, what I think really exists in this community is a lot of sharks, both marketing, supplies, everything, where they come in and they sell a dentist on uh, on a lot of great things, and it just never comes to fruition. So for us, that message I think resonates with with high performing doctors where we can say, hey, look, we'll we'll come in and we'll grow your business on 100% contingency. All we're asking is that we get paid if we have results for you. And you win and, and we win together. And then you, so, um, so to keep this straight, okay, so my office does a dollar a year and it yep. nets a dime. If you yep. come in and invest your dollar into my practice, and it, it goes from doing a dollar and netting a dime, then now it nets two dimes, that right. I'll split that other dime with you. We'll each right. get a nickel. Above, above the, exactly. It has to be above the norm, right? Above yeah. the average. Yeah. Right, so it's any increase above that. So we're, and, we're not. And so would you rather, going forward, is that your business model? You'd rather do that than actually get married and buy the practice and own the practice? Would you rather just no. have that? that no, we'll uh, do both. I know, we'll I know, both, I know, but which one, numbers. but which one excites you more? Well, I mean, the acquisitions definitely excite us, but I do think that there will be some goodwill that starts rolling here when we're able to do this for these practices. And if they do want to sell in, in one to 20 years, they'll be able to come to us and they'll be able to say, Hey, you did a good thing for us. We'd like to talk to you about what we want to do with our, our practice from a transition perspective. I mean, there is that angle, but ultimately we've got to do lots of different things to raise awareness in the community. That, that we are talented, skilled operators, and we know what we're doing, and we think we want to change the, the face of dentistry by providing a different type of relationship with the doctor. And so, but what you said when you acquire practice that you have a, uh, a six-step proprietary system? Correct. Well, th th there's a six-step proprietary system that we go through to grow those businesses. That's correct. Can you, uh, can you summarize what that is? Yeah, again, it starts it starts with with elementary marketing. It goes into deeper marketing, which you know includes um, includes internal strategies as well, uh, focusing on patient experience, focusing on recare, um, making sure your hygiene program is full. We even have one of our last steps of that is is actually a network analysis strategy where we actually will assess whether we should take an office, and it's important I mention this, in or out of network depending on its demographics and, and what we look at, which is proprietary, to, to, to grow that business as well. Okay, let, let me go through it again. So the six sure. steps were uh, first, elementary basic marketing. Number two yep. was more advanced internal marketing. Internal marketing, correct. Three uh, was- Patient, I, well, I'm not, I'm not listing it out exactly, but yeah, three would be, you know, we're focusing on, um, we're, we're focusing on recare. Recare is a big strategy. Patient experience would be another part of that as well. Okay, that's four. Yeah. So you met, um, two more. So th there'd be recare, there'd be patient experience. There's a patient experience element as well. Right. Uh, it would be standardizing patient experience. And then the sixth part is the the network analysis, essentially, where we we are going to assess broadly whether we should take a, an office in or out of network. And it can go either direction, right? Um, I think what some doctors don't know is how should I run my practice from a network status perspective? Some practices actually would fare much better out of network and some practices would be fare much better in network. And so we, we look at both of those as a part of our analysis. Uh, so, um, so it's basic elementary marketing, then advanced internal marketing, uh, the mm -hmm. recare, uh, which you call the hygiene annuity, uh, the right. patient, uh, uh, standardized patient experience, network analysis. Is there anything I missed? Uh, I think that I think that would probably summarize it up. There's probably another step in there somewhere that I'm just not coming up with right now, but uh, there would be six. Yeah. And um, and what is your exit strategy for this? I mean, are you doing this yeah. so that someday you can sell 100 locations to Heartland? Are you thinking an IPO? What what is your exit strategy? We to be honest, we don't know yet. Uh, I mean, it's very attractive, obviously, if we want to sell these practices, um, but we still have a lot of runway to go. 
But I mean, the cash flow on on a on a group of dental practices is also quite rich. And uh, if you are still if you still want to remain in the game and operate them, uh, it might not behoove you to actually sell. Um, and you guys I, are based out of Houston. We're based out of Houston. That's correct. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh. That uh, hurricane. Have you, have you guys? Oh, yeah. uh, are you guys back on your feet from that completely? Or. Yeah, I would say. I would say. I mean, there are some areas that have sort of been transformed. Uh. You know, you go to the Meyerland area as an example, and most of the homes are still on stilts, or they put them on stilts uh, because they'll never get out of that floodplain. Um, luckily where I live, I wasn't affected by it, but I did have a lot of people that I knew that were, it was, it was quite a disaster. What I thought was really interesting though, being someone that's not from Houston originally, I grew up outside Philadelphia. It was quite interesting how the community, not just in Texas, but from other neighboring States, like even Louisiana had come to pitch in and, and really to help out. That was, that was quite amazing to see. I got four of my five grandchildren live in Beeville. Do you know where that is? No, where's that? It, it's between, um, it's about 30 minutes from Corpus Christi. Okay. I, okay. I, I think, how far, how far is Houston from Corpus? Uh, a couple hours. Couple, yeah. And couple they, hours, um, right? they, uh, no longer see me as a dentist because of my good buddy, Tim Rainey in Refurio, Texas has taken over them. But, oh my God, those storms are crazy down there. Um, yeah. I mean, my gosh, uh, um, gosh, I mean, it was. It was crazy. I mean, to see how that thing threw, it was throwing trees around where oh, it, was, it, it was looked like thing. when I was down there, it looked like, it looked like Godzilla took a tree and threw it like a, yeah. chucked it like a spear, crazy yeah. stuff. Uh, but, um, so I'm, um, I'm thinking, um, um, oh, well, first of all, I know someone's listening right now and they're like, well, I got a unique story. If someone wants to know, if yeah. uh, uh, you acquire them, are you only looking in the Texas area? I mean, would you, no. where, where, no, how far it, from home would you go? We're, we're looking to go in any of the states of the union. Um, there, there are some exceptions. Like, for instance, I'm speaking very broadly right now. I mean, New Mexico might be a tough market to break into. Uh, Why is that? Staffing. staffing. Uh, the, the type of dental practices that exist there. Uh, staffing might be an issue. Florida is very hard from a licensure standpoint. Um, but, I mean, the list goes on. Hard some, from a licensure standpoint? Yeah, I think Florida Florida is kind of difficult um, to for a dentist that doesn't have a license to, to go through the application process. We have partners that we want to work with in that situation, friends actually. So uh, where, we'll where's your number one next state that you want to go to? Um, well, I mean, I'm looking all over the place. I love Florida. I will tell you if you oh want to say number one. Oh my God, you didn't, you didn't get the right answer. Name uh, the Arizona, only. I'm looking, at, I'm looking at one in Scottsdale right now. It's, name it's a name the state. only state that just passed a law that will accept a state license from any professional of any of the 50 states. I don't know. Arizona. Is, is it Arizona? That's great. Then that works to our advantage. And, yeah. and that's what the whole country should do. I mean, if you imagine. I why, why is that? Because it's all restrictions of bear. Anytime a business goes to the government, they're going to form a cartel. Because what does the government have? It has two things. It has the legal system, which they call justice. Yeah. Right. And who right. writes the laws? The congressman, where money's yeah. the answer. What's the question? Yeah, who's so, lying, who's so, yeah. so everybody goes and gives the Congress money. And then justice, Lady Liberty's like, oh, well, this is justice. No, it's not. You're enforcing a cartel, and if we don't yeah. go along with it, we'll be put in a cage. And it's all, you know, even Adam Smith said, when two or more men are meeting, they're conspiring against the masses. And oh, it's, so it's, it's all restrictive yeah. governance. So our business-minded governor said, no, if you're, if you're an accountant or a pharmacist or a dentist in New Jersey, and you want to move to Arizona, we'll, we'll accept your license. And so if I was a DSO, there's only one place. And that's why I'll, I'll give you the other measurement. The highest DSO per, uh, per penetration, according to the ADA, who has the best economist in all of healthcare with Marco. Sure, sure. Um, um, God dang, I can't see his name. Just, just know him as Marco. Uh, he's, he's her PhD. He used to work in the World Health Organization, United Nations. But anyway, Arizona is the highest uh, uh, penetration of dentists working for a DSO. It's 18%. It's almost well, one in five. And so, okay. yeah, and they, and you know, um, people just don't like the weather in New Jersey and Minnesota sure. uh, and Canada. I mean, why? I mean, yeah. if you're living in Canada, you're probably happy because your brain is frozen 
and you can't think straight. <laughs> and, and, and so that's the next question they're all asking here. They're like, what about foreign licenses? Because the next logical step is for my Canadian homies, eh? Uh, that come on, you're a practicing dentist in Toronto. Um, and, and by the way, I, I when you said something, you oh, we're, we're over an hour. Um, when you opened up with that um, very uh, sad story about um, yep. her uh, Nishano Thomas's uh, kidney transplants, when I got out of school, I came to Arizona and I was looking for a job, but I was building my office. I only wanted to work somewhere four months. Well, no one wanted to hire an associate for four months, but yeah. there was this one lady. And she was like an 80 year old lady who owned like four dental offices. And I said, well, what's her story? And they said, well, she fled Adolf Hitler. And, right. um, and when she got to America, they wouldn't accept her dental license, which I agree with because she came from the country that makes Mercedes Benz. And yeah. you know, we, this is the land of Chrysler. So obviously a German dentist making Porsche and Audi is not good enough to be an American dentist. Yeah, it's and, a contradiction. And, and, and she went to an attorney and they said, well, you know, it's all restriction against fair trade, but you know what? There is a loophole. You can own a dental office. So she was handcuffed. She said she cried, she cried, she cried. But since she couldn't drill with her hands, she just had to do the business. And because of yeah. that, what did she have? Four offices doing two and a half million each. She had a 10 million. And when I met her, she had a, a, a limo and a driver driving her to her offices, great. having the time of her life. And she was like in her eighties, netting, netting one and a half million in cash because she her. couldn't drill, fill and bill. And if you look at Heartland Dental, that guy owns the most dental offices. He hasn't seen a patient in 30 years. The other Rick, yeah. uh, you know, Rick Workman, the other Rick Kirshner, he hadn't seen a patient in 30 years. So yeah. what that reminds you is when you get out of school, and you're trying to take every hands-on course and you're trying to get your FAGD, MAGD diplomat like yep. I did. All that time you're drilling, filling, and billing, you ain't learning nothing about the business of dentistry. And you know, then and then, what do dentists do? They say, you know what I'll do? I'll, I'll work hard Monday through Thursday. Then Friday morning, I'll go in and do the business. Yeah, they wake up yeah, Friday morning, they're fried. Well, so yeah. they go golfing yeah. and they and, and I say, you know, if you wanna do business half day a week, Make it Monday flipping morning. Go in there yeah. strong. And so, and they don't want to do any of that because in the, the day, we're chefs. We want to make lasagna. I'm a dentist. I'd rather pull wisdom teeth and go play golf at any yeah. golf course in the world. And my homies, they, they, they work with their hands. They, 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 their art is fixing teeth. I'm addicted to it. They love it. Uh, and that's why guys like you are going to make a big impact on this career because you see the Achilles tendon and that is yeah. not one of them knows their numbers. Well, I, th I think, I mean, within the broader context of the education crisis here, like especially with student loans and everything, I, I think it's important to mention, I, I, I don't know how a dental school can justify charging the amount that it charges. I and mean, there could be some ignorance on my end here. Well, there is, there is a big... That's, well, they, that, they statement, they that statement is from Pluto, because if you're outraged that the dental schools are charging that much for, um, um, they graduate with $280,000 of student loans, and are you outraged by the lawyers where the average dentist divorce is a million dollars? I mean, oh, I I mean think, if you think I mean, your student loan bill is high, wait till you get your divorce bill. But when you, but when you say $280,000, man, I, I haven't met a dentist that's, that's under 400. That's, and so, you know, what, what I find to be a problem is that they're going to school and they're not being taught anything about business. I mean, even basic prerequisites for someone like yourself as an MBA, basic prerequisites and even, even hands-on practical, like having a conversation or having courses focused on working with office managers and understanding human capital and understanding human behavior and understanding, you know, how to manage people and, and how to lead. Those are things that that are vitally important to the success of your business while you're carrying all that debt and paying that debt off. And I think it's a travesty that I'm not the only one echoing this, I'm sure, but it's a travesty you can come out of school with that much debt. And there isn't a cry from a, almost a unionization of those going to dental school to say, you you must provide this to me as a part of the curriculum. Um, that's, I think, I think that's vitally important. And you know, another thing too is I might get in trouble saying this, but I think in a way, if you are anti-corporate, again, I think we're a different breed of group dental, uh, group dentistry. But in a way, if corporate dentistry is going to take off, it's going to take off as a byproduct of the student loan situation and the inability of 
dentists to understand how to manage and scale a business. If they did, they wouldn't be forced into the situation where they'd have to actually work for, for corporates for 10 years, right? I mean, that's just my personal take on it. But um, again, I'm not, going, I'm not going to dog the, the, the dentist working for corporates because eventually they come work for me. But, uh, but, I, but I do think that that will be a byproduct that needs to be recognized. Um, so do you think, um, but, but you don't want new graduates anyway. No, I mean, it's that I don't want it. It sounds so mean, right? Like I don't, well, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't want, I, mean, I don't want, right. Yeah. I mean, I just, I need the experience, right? It's, it's hard for me to take a new grad who, you know, it's going to take them, you know, three hours to prep, right? I can't, I can't do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, I mean, we're all selfish uh, at the end of the day. I mean, if I had to have, um, a, a surgery, uh, say, yeah. um, say I'd have a bypass or a prostate or whatever. Well, I don't, I don't, I, I want that guy in the sweet spot between like yeah. 40 and 50. I don't want someone yeah. as old as me and I don't want someone <laughs> as young as them. I, I want some guy right in the sweet spot. So, uh, um, yeah, I, I, that's why I think army, Navy, air force. Um, I love Aspen, Aspen. Um, they go to the port that their focus is on the Medicaid where there's no dentist yeah. with an in-house lab man. And, and yeah. my, um, they, uh, I've lost a lot of patients to them because uh, they, they, they have, uh, they'll go in and get a, their denture line for $89. It's like, oh yeah, <laughs> I don't want to do that. In fact, I'd pay them $89 yeah. and drive them <laughs> to Aspen just because <laughs> I don't want to do that. It's not my market yeah. niche and, and, and God yeah. bless them that they, they want to do that. I, I don't want to get in bed with Medicaid and I sure as hell don't want to reline dentures. Yeah. And if I do it, I certainly am not doing it for 89 bucks. Um, but um, yeah, my God, I could talk to you forever. Um, last thing I want to ask is last, last ask. And when you're growing these high value practices, is there any yeah. expensive equipment that you think is is mandatory or, or a, a, an, an obvious basic given? No, I mean, I, I, I do think you need good imaging. Uh, I think sensors, I mean, that's not a real high ticket item, but I do think going digital is really important. I do think an, an integral digital scanner is really, really important. Um, we use Itero. Uh, I think that's, that's something I think would be mandatory. I think if it provides uh, a better clinical experience and it allows you to, I think even the progression, dental progression is important as well, being able to take those multiple images over time and show the progression of, of someone's oral health. I think that's that's extremely important. Um, I would say that's, I, I don't wanna say necessary, but but darn near necessary. Okay. That's what I would say. Um, is there, and if someone wants to talk to you about a specific deal, if they're like, you know, I, I want you to come uh, by my office or do that sure. thing. Um, how, how would they contact you? Really simple. I mean, you want me to get my number? I can give you my yeah, number, yeah. email. Yeah. So my phone number is 610-750-0836. That's direct to me. It's my cell, or you can reach me via email. It's going to be Michael dot Pontrelli, that's P-O-N-T-R-E-L-L-I at memorialparkdental.com. That's memorialparkdental.com, all one word. But I'm happy to talk to anybody about, even if they have an office doing, you know, a million, million one, and, and they don't want to sell it right now, but they could use some growth advice and I can go in there and analyze their practice for them. And I'm willing to invest a hundred, hundred thousand of up to a hundred thousand dollars of my own money, of our own money into it to, to show them what we can do. Uh, all we ask is for that that consideration down the line. And if you want to email me, uh, my email is Howard at Chippendales.com. That's C-H-I-P-P-E-N-D-A-L-E-S, where I'm not just the owner. I, I'm actually the dancer. Howard at Chippendales.com. <laughs> hey, Mike, it was awesome to have you on the show. Uh, yeah. I learned so much. Um, and I, I wish you'd go into Dental Town because Dental Town, like I say, it's, it's where everybody thinks... DSOs are public enemy number one. And yesterday some little girl said, well, you know what? I, yep. I, they gave me a job and I, I really like working here. In fact, we published that list of the, uh, the Inc, uh, the Inc 5,000 fastest growing private companies in America and 29 of them were dental companies. And so yeah. I posted that on dental town and, uh, people say, ah, DSO, DSO. This little girl says, well, man, I'm proud that my company's on the list and I'm proud they gave me a job and, all you old farts didn't give me a job and I don't want to give them a job. So, uh, um, thanks for coming on the show and talking about this area. And, uh, uh, it's been a real, um, informative time, uh, for me to podcast so. interview. Thanks Mike. So. Thank you. Thanks. Howard. Have a great day. Bye-bye. You too.